So Tom's. Oh, Tessa's not in yet, but we're going to go ahead and start calling him in. I think they just closed the door. That's why I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go ahead and get everyone to walk in? And I'm going to call their names as they start to come. Yes, here we go. We have Mila K. Davis Kent, actor director Michael B. Jordan, actor Jonathan Majors, actor Selenice Lieva. Screenwriter Keenan Kugler, screenwriter Zach Balin, and actor Wood Harris. If you all could go ahead and come up here and grab your seats. Also, I want to let everyone know in this room, and I will repeat this when we go live, we want to welcome our two ASL interpreters, Brandon and Karina. They will be helping us out by interpreting today. And again, we'll hear this again once we get going. We're going to mention it again for the webinar, folks. We are still waiting on Tessa. I think we are going to wait on her to walk in before we get started, correct? Okay. Don't be surprised. <laughs> no, no, we definitely have it. Go ahead. Or no. I think she's walking off the elevator, so let's just give it one quick second. Here we go. And Miss Tessa Thompson. Hello, ma'am. Good morning. Okay, one second. Hi, I'm Evelyn. Just a quick little thing. We're going to be taking this live. I'm going to give you a cue of 5 4. Jacqueline, our moderator, will take it live naturally. At the end of this whole thing, we'll wave goodbye. This camera right here will be your master shot, your wide shot, and you have a close up. Once we go live, you will be seen by all our virtual press as well. So thank you, and I'll be taking this live shortly. In 5, 4, 3, Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jacqueline Coley and it is my honor to welcome all of you to the Global Press Conference for MGM's Creed 3. I am welcomed here today by our actor, Tessa Thompson, actor, Mila Davis-Kent, director and actor, Michael B. Jordan, actor, Jonathan Majors, producer Ryan Kugler will be joining us shortly, actor, Selenice Sel Lieva, Screenwriter, Keenan Kugler. Screenwriter, Zach Balin. And actor, Wood Harris. Everyone, welcome and congratulations on the film. <laughs> Mr. Michael B. Jordan, sir, I would like to begin with you because we've already seen the initial reviews. We've already had the premiere in London. We have already had, you know, people are already talking about it online. But for you, before all of this happened, there had to be a moment where producer, friend, Ryan Coogler, turned to you and said, hey, do you want to direct this? And I just wanted to know after that, what were the conversations you had with him or any of the other great directors that you worked with that helped you sort of get ready for this moment? Uh, to, to be clear, it, it was never a moment like that. <laughs> there wasn't? No, there wasn't. Uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> He definitely had a lot, a lot to do with it. You know, I, I think um, he told me that I could, I could direct. You know, I think there was a moment where you know um, I was in awe of what he was doing. You know, seeing a, you know, a black man my age, um, somebody I knew well, uh, we're getting to know at, at that time, command a set. You know, on Fruitvale Station. You know, and and um, and what was possible. You know, and I, I think, I think um, for me. Him telling me like Mike, you can do this too. You know, it was kind of where that first kind of seed got planted in my head of like, okay, maybe I could direct one day. I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't know what 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 movie it was going to. Um, I was going to uh, step behind the camera on. But as you know, we did Creed, and you know, um, and we did Creed Two came along, and Stephen, you know, jumped into you know the director's chair and had that experience. And as we kind of grew, the third one just seemed like it was the perfect time for me to step behind the camera and from you know internally with myself, Erwin Winkler being, you know, another one as well, um, my manager, you know, just talk to some people that I really respect the opinion, and Ryan definitely was one of them. It was like, all right, cool, this is like the perfect, perfect opportunity to step behind the camera. And I think preparing to shoot this this movie, Ryan had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of thoughts. You know, he was a great sounding board for me. So was John Favreau and Bradley Cooper and Denzel Washington. Those are those some people that I tapped into to kind of get their opinions and, and thoughts and uh -huh. the man himself. Yeah, the man himself, Ryan, producer Ryan, Ryan Coons. And um, 
and yeah, just you know, people that are, I really want to talk to active directors. You know, knowing that that was going to be a big you know challenge for me. To, you know, being behind the camera and in front of the camera simultaneously. Uh, so th those people have had you know success at doing it. Um, sometimes their first project being that as well. So that really helped inform me on what to expect, even though there was nothing that anybody could really tell me to prepare me for what the journey was going to be like. It was one of those things you just have to, you got to live it and get through it. And um, <laughs> the hardest thing I've had to do so far, but at the same time, I felt the most alive doing it. So it was rewarding. Well, so what I'm hearing is we're going to see this again, you know, another directed by Michael B. Jordan. This is like, this is already like tapped that sort of bug, as it were. I think so. I, I, I think so. I, 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 I can say that, yeah, for sure. I like that. That's a good bug to tap again. Everybody's already talking about it. Um, also, if you're going to do this type of thing, it's almost like going into a battle. Of course, you would want to have one of, you know, somebody that you've been to battle in before alongside. And obviously, I think, I think in our interview recently, Tessa mentioned you guys were not kids, but you were kids when you first started this and you've moved further. I would just ask you, Tessie, you're in a unique position where you've now been directed by each of these different directors with Bianca. But with this one, what do you think about the colors that you guys brought to her in this chapter? Is it a different look from her, where she is in her career, their relationship? What would you say, Michael's direction? How did you guys approach it differently than even what you did with Steven or Ryan? Thank you for that. I, I think something I've always really enjoyed about making these films and that began with Ryan and our work together is I feel like I've always been invited to really be a co-author um, and to be so a part of the collaborative process of building Bianca together um, with them and so it feels like I've gotten to continue to do that. I think the interesting thing over making these films over the course of, I've been saying eight years and then you told me the other day it's nine, Mike, right? It's, insane, yeah. it's crazy. It's, insane. it's crazy. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think the thing that I'm, I'm finding so fascinating is the ways in which our growth, our personal growth as people gets to be communicated inside of the characters in a way and that is a very unique Thing. I mean, we're, we're separate in a way, but I think some of the things that our characters are contending with and some of the things that Mike and I are contending with personally, we get to explore in the context of these films. And I think that's something that is really a gift. I think you're always hoping to get to make a f f films and to be working on something that is also tasking you to ask questions of yourself. Um, and I think in terms of some of the things that we're unpacking in this, which has to do with like, what does it look like to have successful partnership inside of your dreams? That's definitely a question we ask ourselves, <laughs> the two of us, we get to ask inside of the context of making these films. Like what, do, what does your personhood look like when it's not entirely tethered to what you do in the world or what you make or your success? what is success like those really central human questions that i think we're in a point in our lives when, where we're really asking we get to also put inside of the script or what does it look like to unpack masculinity what does friendship look like what does black brotherhood look like um inside of spaces that typically are competitive i think all of those themes are really things that we get to tease out in, in developing these films, and I feel very lucky to get to work on something where there's an opportunity to do that. And we're really lucky we get to watch it. Like, I'm not gonna lie, just listening to you talk about, just the idea of being able to have a relationship on screen in chapters like that, it's just really blessed, and like, again, with black characters, we don't really get that very often, so it's, it's amazing. Um, as awesome as they are in their love affair, here comes Diamond and Dame, you know, just wreaking havoc both in all you know it's like we're up here in love jones and here you come just like as a snack to that happiness but what a beautiful way to go mr jonathan majors i do have to ask you though because i know um this was a collaboration again i think for everyone involved but i know that when you came into this it was a conversation with you you know his name changed so much of the character changed what was one of the things that was very central to the character though that you wanted to make sure stayed in all of these different iterations as you guys shaped it what was a part of that initial part of the script that you really sort of sort of found him in that you wanted to make sure as y'all shaped it stayed there wicked um 
Yeah, I think the most um, ancient quality um, that was you know, put in, you know, by the homies was uh, this aspiration for freedom. Um, and not just physical freedom, but mental freedom. Um, and that's what we, that, that never changed, that never shifted. Um, that was the thing that I went, okay, that makes sense to me. They baked it in, Mike saw it, we went after, you know. Um, it's something that, it's the most universal quality in the piece. Second to that is brotherhood, I think. And that brotherhood um, became paramount, becomes paramount, because that's connected between um, our hero and me. Um, so those two elements, and, and the changing of the name is all about uh, implication. The idea that, um, for those of you who don't know, um, what was Brandon, let's ask the home, what was Brandon's last name at first? We gave him like a, a generic, generic name. <laughs> yeah, 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 so his name was Brandon, and then um, um, Mike came and, and said, oh, dang, okay, dang, my name is wrong, dang. <laughs> um, and then, um, Whatever that generic last name was, uh, it was up in the air to be ch to be uh, uh, changed potentially. And I said, "Well, how about Anderson?" And Anderson is my uh, maternal uh, last name. It's my mother's last name. Um, and that had to do with implication. You know, I, I can't tell you one of the highlights of the uh, experience was when Mike said yes to that. And then when I walked in, you know, the day of fighting, and yeah, we've done a lot of prep, and I'm. The steel, you know, I'm in a Rocky movie, I'm in a Creed movie, I'm about to fight like a B. Joy. It's on, you know what I mean? You, you look, you're a little nervous. There's a little something going on, but you look out there and you see, you know, Adonis, and you see Anderson, and that type of implication, that type of like, oh, we're here now, this is me, this is, this is us, you know. Uh, that was a huge gift uh, for my director, and uh, just kept, kept the process more emboldened, you know. Uh, again, I, those little touches really just make the film that more richer when you watch just how much you destroy him throughout it. We do have an audience here today, uh, and so I want to turn it to all of you if you have any questions. It does, it makes it just much better. Um, yes, we're gonna, uh, there's a microphone though, so we're just going to wait one second for the microphone to get to her in this front row. Yes, thank you. Go ahead and say your name, Outlet. Sure. Hi, Nikki Fowler, Glitter Magazine. Um, my questions for Tessa. Um, loved your portrayal uh, in this film. How did you balance the strength and the delicateness of your character? Oh, um, that's such an interesting question. I, you know, I actually was really interested in this time around getting to see a softening from her. I think something that's always been interesting and I remember Ryan and I would have conversations on the first one was like chipping away at this exterior that was outwardly very very tough um, and guarded in a way and I think over the course of the films we've seen that soften I think motherhood is something that softened has softened her tremendously um, but I, I felt very grateful because there was an idea that I had to Mike you know of, of him saying to Bianca you know, that your emotions, for example, come so easy to you, and this idea of her actually being like, no, it's, it's actually challenging. This is, this is challenging for me. It's not easy for me. And I think so often there is this idea, particularly of black womanhood, that has to do with strength, that we are the pillars of our community, that we are the backbones of our family, that we lift our men up, um, and that's beautiful and that is very often true, and also it is not not hard-earned, you know, and it's not easy. And I really wanted her to have the opportunity to say that. Um, and I felt very grateful that, that, he, that Mike felt open to it, and, you know, I was like, can I try this, you know, and that it gets to exist in the film, because for me, I feel like that that is, um, it feels like an honest portrayal of her that she gets to, that she gets to also unravel some. Thank you. Yeah, great question. I'm gonna go right here. Yes, yes, um, there's a microphone right behind you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my question's for uh, Michael Jordan. Uh, visually, it, like, great job, by the way. Like, I'm still floored by like the visual, especially the visuals of the movie. Like, the shot of the movie is when the before Dame's fight, you're, you just talk to him, you're on the left side, outside of his locker room, he's on the right side. And the lighting, the framing, the color. Okay, we gotta get to a question. <laughs> 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 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, I know he's like, I'm not that I don't want you to get a big head. I do. But I should have lost so much time to be here. Come talk to him after. I, mean, I, like, I, like, I, like, I like that scene too, man. Yeah, I was like, I want to hear more. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry. How uh, can you tell us a little bit like how important it was to be able to bring all these visuals to the story and create your own kind of flavor with the visuals in the movie? Yeah, first of all, thank you, man. I um, appreciate that. It was, it was, a, you know, uh, I think something the first time you know, you know, directing or you know, you're in your head thinking about all right. You know, what's your style going to be? You know, like all, you, you, you overthink y yourself. You know, going into it, um, you know, trying to create your own visual language. And, um, you know, say I'm, I'm following Ryan and Steven. Oh man, I got to do this. I got to do that. You know, I think there's a little bit of that that you spend in your head a little bit. Um, and I think something that you, know, you start to realize is that it's just showing up and being honest every day. You know, and then slowly your style will start to shape itself. You know, I can't even tell you what it is right now, but you know, at, you know, the movies, you know, done and finished with. I think that is a representation of just my truth. You know, things that, you know, compiles of like things that I watch, things that I like to look at, things that you know moves me in an emotional way, in a visual way, and I started to like you know put it together. You know, with uh, you know Kramer Mordenthau, you know my, my my DP, who you know it's our third film that we've worked together. We have a shorthand. He understands the vision, what I'm trying to accomplish, and then. Me taking swings. There's some scenes and shots in the movie that I've like dreamt about. Literally, I've dreamt about. You know, I've imagined daydreamed in my head, and when you see it on screen, I'm like, oh man, like that's a that's very that's the type of grat gratification that you get out of that is is is, um, is, is is crazy. So, I mean, to just I guess simply answer the question, you know, I I just think it's a reflection of things that I think moves me and I think tells the truth. You know, um, and it's what's necessary and needed for the moment. And that, that, was, that was one of those moments. Can I just ask this as a follow-up because I've watched a lot of your interviews. If you did a director's commentary on just anime influences, could you do the entire movie? About 70% of it. 70% of it. As I literally am not even that big of an anime head and I was like, Crunchyroll needs to pay me for the anime track at some I mean, point. Even, even not intentionally, like just, yeah. I could find the, 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 the correlation between the two for sure. The story, bro. Yeah, it's amazing. It, it, the visuals are amazing, though. I'm, I'm, I would say in the best way possible, just the way you would say the same thing watching a Tarantino movie and Kung Fu Elements. It's really, yeah, it's visual. Right here, and then we're going to go to our virtual questions. Yes, right here. Hello, congratulations on the film. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for putting a Mexican-American, finally, in a boxing movie. There are so many greats that we've never seen. And secondly, this film is so tight as far as visually, there's no downtime. I actually forgot to go to the bathroom because I had to go, but I didn't have time. Uh, I was waiting for downtime, but this movie is just really, really tight. How did you guys work to get it just so, I mean, just flows and, like I said, there's no downtime. So to kind of just relax, it's just like, go, go, go. Is this for Michael? Michael and Ryan, how did you work with the editors? Yeah. Uh, I'm still learning how to answer these questions. <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, you write one movie, you shoot one movie, and you, and you edit one movie. You know, um, I think the movie starts to tell you what it needs. Um, that's something I've learned, you know, on, on this process. You know, the, you know there's, there's scenes that are on the edit room floor that I, I mean, had to be ripped from my fingers. <laughs> that, 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 but at the end of the day, it does, you know, when you worry about runtime and, you know, pace and you know, you're listening to, you know, test test screenings and you know cars and how people feel about certain things that are that are you know it starts to take a life of its own and you have to give it what it needs in order to be the best version of it so so i think um you know and then you know, sometimes i hit ryan in the middle of the night hey man you know what about this i mean are you, are you sure I, do i not need it do i not need it okay you sure are you sure okay you know, and getting that reassurance to somebody who's been through that process before you know you know writing his baby you know making his baby and then having to you know kill his darlings in certain areas it's not an easy thing um, so like getting that emotional support was extremely helpful um, and getting a closer uh, unbiased eye you know what I'm saying as it's not too not, not, not too close to it you know um, was ex extremely helpful um, and then yeah you know the the visuals are just it's just a reflection of things that I love and I like to see and um, I was curious that if other people might be able if they saw them would they feel the same way and, and hearing you guys response or reaction is, uh, is validating that. I'm just so grateful you didn't go to the bathroom during any of our emotional scenes. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, Brian, real quick before I go to these, is there anything you wanted to add to that? There's been a, t a lot of talk about towards the stuff that you did before you came in. Is there anything you wanted to add as far as like what conversations you guys had during the post-production process? Not particularly. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was it was just great to it was great to uh, to watch Mike work and. It's, it's super rewarding to to be um, to support filmmakers. You know, um, it, it gives you a different type of um, creative fulfillment. You know, um, and and I, I love it. So I was I was always happy to get the text messages or or, or to come come by. And, and we had a great editorial team. Um, performances were great. Script was great. You know, I, I was just just really it was very uh, satisfying experience. Um, to 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 be involved and in, in, to help help him realize his vision. Love that. We're gonna go to the virtual questions here, and we're gonna start with you, Mila, um, from Sean at Nerdtropolis. Uh, you threw some great punches in the movie and showed impressive boxing skills. Uh, were you exposed to boxing before joining the film? And like your character, do you have any interest in the sport? Okay, well, no. Prior to the film, I didn't have any experience with boxing, and I wasn't really interested in it, to be honest. But Anne, the Mick Queen, taught me a lot of technique. So my character, when I got the role, I realized that being a boxer was part of that character. And so that made me more interested in it because she was interested, she was interested in being a boxer because her dad was. So after I started doing it, I realized, you know, boxing is a lot of fun. Um, I don't think I'm going to try to be a boxer in real life, because <laughs> I'm kind of scared of being hit, to be honest, but um, when I was doing it, I had a lot of fun, and I thought it was a great experience. I'm, I'm, I'm digging that. <laughs> and, and she was a, such a fast learner, you know, I think from watching and, 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 and paying attention to McQueen and, you know, and, and following instructions to a T, she picked it up extremely fast and she's a, she's a natural at it. So, you know, a lot of those, you know, her technique and things like that were cultivated in a very short amount of time, but she she's fearless and there was nothing that seemed too big for her to, 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 uh, to accomplish. So she's really, really good. Uh, this one's going to be for Wood, Sir Kevin uh, from Parl Magazine. Duke seems to know exactly how this story is going to play out before it does. Again, we should have listened to Duke. This is true. Why do you think he doesn't see a chance uh, for redemption? Yeah, why did Duke know everything? Why didn't he see the redemption for Dame? It's the gray hairs, you know? <laughs> Wisdom. <laughs> Just being close with a person and having a perception on the person, I believe, that would that would give you some insight on, on the future of, of what you believe may happen. And then if when that happens, you get to be like, I told you so or not. But yeah. Experience. No, that's true. And also in the previous Rocky films, like, dude, he was the same way. He always knew. That's true. Uh, Selenice, this is from Ava Coleman from Texas Metro News. Your character, Laura Chavez, is a boss. <laughs> Facts. And how her character resembles how you take charge in your own life. Does her character resemble how you take charge in your own life? Sorry, I'm going blind. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, I'm a mama. I'm a mama bear, and I protect the people I love. And there's conviction when there's you know passion you you go for it and that's what i loved about this character um she was written so well and thank you guys <laughs> um and you know and the director here let me just kind of just do my thing and i love that i love that this movie although when people think about a boxing film they automatically think male you know and the power of the man but here is like the power of the women also exists in this film from Mila's character to Tess to, to Laura. So I love that. I love that it's well-rounded and powerful black and brown people doing their thing. Also, nice. kind of, yeah, he's scared of, of you. Like, legitimately, when things go wrong with Felix, he is not scared about what Felix is going to do. He's scared about what yeah. you're going to do. Max, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I love that the scene when he gets, hurt, you know, there, there's a moment and I turn to him and I was like, I'm going to eat you alive. Yeah. I, I did see a little bit of fear in his face. <laughs> a lot of fear. 
Uh, Ryan, I wanted to take it really quickly here. Lupe from, uh, sorry, Lupe from Ha Cinema Movie. You and Michael have worked with each other for now over a decade. What do you like most about working with each other? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> like most. I think, I think like, oh, oh yeah, bro. Oh, 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 I mean now, now it's, it's the fact that um that I'm normally you know you know really really well so we, so so I think that adds like a, it's like added color that that comes with that um so when you when you know somebody um and you see them do something new and they excel at it 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 it, it gives you um uh, a different type of joy like when I first met him I knew he could act you know what I'm saying um so it wasn't like oh man Mike did a great job acting like it's not a surprise you know. Um, but 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 now and seeing him, oh, can he can he can he do a a, a a sports film? You know, can he do an action movie? You know what I mean? Can he, can he direct? You know, like like in in, in seeing um, the growth and the and the shifts and seeing him knock it out of the park and in, in each thing, um, not without struggles. You know what I'm saying? Not without going to the mat and having to get back up. Uh, it, it's it's a really um, it's a really, really like I keep using this word, but it's like satisfying. It's rewarding, you know. Um, it's affirming. Uh, you know, you, you meet actors like Ted felt this way about Ted, felt this way about Jonathan, and they, and they talk about authorship. But I meet him, and I say, oh, I think this person is a director. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they're acting now, but I can see a world where, you know, it's directed by Ted Thomas and directed by Jonathan Majors. You know what I'm saying? And, and me, as a filmmaker, I get excited about these movies. I want to watch it. You know, you know what I'm saying. Like, and, and, and so, and so, like to, to, to see this this happen and it get and it, and it be affirmed that that suspicion I had about this creative, you know, um, ten years later, it's like, oh yeah, he had it in him. And it's fantastic and to be a part of it. Man, forget about it. You know? <laughs> yeah, maybe you need to be a talent scout like everywhere now. Like seriously, like, <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, it's a little bit of being a director. You gotta, yeah. you gotta be a little bit of a scout. You know what I mean? Like. But, um, Pretty good track record, like. Legit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Zach and Keenan, this one's for you. This, what it's, I don't have a person that this is from, but I want to make sure that I ask you guys what. <laughs> I wish I could tell you. What was the inspiration for this story, and how did you tackle this chapter of Adonis's story? Zach, I'll start with you. Um, inspiration. I mean, I, it was a very collaborative script writing process and it, you know I think that the inspiration came from a lot of places you know it came from talking to Michael about what the next chapter of Adonis's life that he wanted to explore and and uh, and Bianca and it came from you know from talking to Ryan about what was happening in, in all of our lives that we thought we could get out and and really put into this movie and then you know Keenan and I had this pretty amazing collaboration where we got to really just talk about you know what what we thought was possible in a movie like this and um, and you know how we could make it personal for everyone involved and and I think that getting to work there are not that many like franchises or films of this caliber where you get to work with these kind of actors and actually like make a movie that's about something and that for me that was the most exciting part was that like oh yes yeah, like the all the exciting elements of of the boxing and the inspirational story was going to be there but also like these characters are so deep and dynamic and and we really got to explore a lot of things that was like it's pretty rare in a movie of this scale i want to tweak yours that's why i wanted zach to go first because you you know you saw ryan go through the first creed you probably were maybe texting him a day when he was writing it you know before it was even going to be a reality before they'd even pitched it how does it now? How did it feel to then sort of transfer that? Because you you were probably one of the first people that knew that he was writing a Creed script before, yeah. and now you're writing the third installment of it. I used to make fun of him because I thought he was making the whole thing up. Because <laughs> <laughs> we shared a room at the time <laughs> at my parents' house, and uh, <laughs> sorry, buddy, <laughs> <laughs> we shared a room at my parents' house, 
and he was working on the script literally from the idea in his head and he would talk about it and then he would go out and have these telephone conversations with Sylvester Stallone <laughs> and he would talk on the phone like and he would like go down the street and you would just see him pacing up and down the street talking and I thought he was making the entire thing up. Like, <laughs> no fucking way, excuse my language, but no way, no way would Stallone even answer that phone call, right? <laughs> And then I worked on the movie. <laughs> so if you watch Creed 1, I'm literally underneath the ring in pretty much all the shots. So Ryan had to set up a little village that would be underneath the ring so that we wouldn't have to sprint off camera every take. And uh, that was me. I was underneath there watching these guys create this character. But the funnest part, honestly, has been watching the character of Adonis change hands. But the entire time, he is... You know, everybody who sort of had, and to John at this point, implicated themselves in this character, they're growing up with him in real time. And it's really interesting because I've been working with these two for, you know, over 10 years now, and we've all sort of grown up with this character. Um, so the scenes get super emotional because everybody's implicated in them. You know, when Adonis is struggling, it's hard not to imagine where that came from, you know, and I really love that. This character has always been like equal parts Mike and Ryan, um, and Mike's been a big brother to me from day one. But like to now sort of be tethered by this actual character that people respond to, it just makes it f that much more fun to to write the character. Um, and I'm a genre guy, so like I came in first day trying to pull Mike's references out of. I know he likes anime, but I know he's not going to always lead with that in these big scary rooms. I was the one that was like, no, tell them this from the episode. Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> and we liked it, and we want to put this in the movie. This is some real nerdy stuff. I'm not getting off the Zoom until they know what episode it's like. Y'all see what we're doing. <laughs> Am I wrong? Honestly, this is so affirming because I was watching and thinking that. So thank you very much for affirming. I said if the nuts are going to run in that house, we're going to do it our way. <laughs> Very burning, thank you. Sorry for cursing, I'll get excited about this stuff. <laughs> it's your show. <laughs> you wrote it. Um, we're going to go back to the virtual question. This is too much fun, I'm doing a bad job. I'm sorry. Tessa, uh, this one's for you. Throughout the trilogy, Bianca plays a huge part of Adonis' successful career with her nonstop support, push, and love. How important is it to continue to showcase that having the right partner can help you achieve your goals no matter how impossible they may seem? that's a lot but that is that is a lot so yeah yeah you know you know i think the, the the truth is those partnerships can come in any form with adonis and bianca it happens to come in the form of romantic love their co-parents but that's not for everybody not everybody has that not everybody wants that i think the thing that i love about these films so much and particularly in the first one you really get to see Rocky and Adonis and Bianca make a little chosen family, you know, and that is the reality for a lot of folks. And so I think what I love about these films is they're about relationships, the relationship between mentor and mentee, the relationship between father and son, whether chosen or blood, the relationship between parents, the relationship between, you know, folks that have history that can stand to learn from each other and unpack their trauma. So. I, I love that I get to exist in this with Mike and that we get to push each other and love each other in the context of these films and individually as friends, but I think it's really about whoever your partner is, whoever is in the ring, the proverbial ring with you, and that can take on so many forms. And sometimes it's just you in the ring alone, and that's okay too. Like Sometimes it's going to be that, um, and that's what I love about these films. Yeah, that's so good. And then there's a shot in the movie where it's just them in the ring alone. Wow, that's that's amazing parallels. Uh, Keenan wrote that for me. <laughs> uh, Christopher Gallarado from Hollywood Handle has for Jonathan, as Dame Anderson, and you inject a lot of physical and emotional energy into making your character unique to Creed's family history as well as the overall story. Were there any aspirations or inspirations you had for the character once you solidif uh, once you were solidified for the film? So I guess, what did you have anybody that you were pulling from uh, to shape the character? Oh uh, yeah, 
in a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell, um, uh, first and foremost, um, I was my my stepfather. Um, the idea of freedom I spoke about earlier. Uh, my stepdad uh, was locked up 15 years before he got with my mom and then raised me up. Um, the ankle monitor situation, the PO, the you know, there's box at the house. Like I was the kid that was like trying to make sure dad got home on time, you know, before the parole officer got to the crib. And I and I watched it. You know, I watched that happen. My stepdad also, um, yeah, Joe. I'm gonna say his name. He. Um, he tried out for the Dallas Cowboys. I'm from Dallas. It made it to all, almost made it, almost made it to the Cowboys. He was in the second round, right? Um, I watched that aspiration. I watched that hustle. You know, I watched that dream that he had. Um, There's a big part about that, that big hard shell, you know, that that young boy in it that had the aspirations to, to be more, to be free. Um, so that's a big part of it. Probably, probably, probably 50. But not a big part, just half. Um, and then we had the brother, um, uh, Ryan's best friend, D'Lo, um, who was essentially my just touched on. You know, he, he actually had experienced um, very much the, the life that uh, Dame had experienced, you know. I got pictures of D'Lo standing, you know what I mean, and how he stood. There's a certain uh, uh, decorum to the lifestyle that D'Lo just had, still had walked with it, talked with it, and I could check in with him at the time of the day, and every time we saw each other, it was, we was talking that shit, you know, it was like, yeah, I was like, boom, we was in. And then uh, Paramount, I think, uh, as far as inspiration, yeah, I watched all the Rocky films, did all that, but it was very clear to me um, that the only thing that was really important was who Adonis was in this third installment, and how to antagonize this character, how to help this character continue his um, hero's journey. And so I studied Adonis, and I studied Mike, and I saw everything, that, I saw his values, and us being brothers, you know, being close friends, how our, our values had to be similar, and how we went after it had to be different. And so that is a lot of the, uh, the, the film is all relational for Dame. Dame lives and dies on his relationship with Adonis Creed. Everything else is uh, set decoration, you know, it's all about him. And so that was the most um, fertile, I think inspiration, and that I met every day. You know that I got to meet every day. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just say that Jonathan, um, when I was on set, watching him, in particular, I there were moments where you want to hate him, <laughs> and as Lauda, I had to go there. But me, the actress, was like, wow. I wanted to hug him. <laughs> I, I did. There was there was a heartbreaking moments where I just look at him and I was like. I just want to hug him. So kudos to the person that could be that powerful and that menacing, but at the same time, break your heart. Mm -hmm. I needed to say that. Yeah. No, it's very true. Yeah, I, I want to give you a promise while I can too, by the way. Now, I would tell a quick story just to show how, fun, how much fun I had doing this with you, bro. But it was a tense, tense morning and. Uh, he came up to me after, I think it was like a lunch break or something. I was like, how you feeling in there, man? How you, you know, trying to keep your spirits up? I was like, you feel like you got the green light in there? Look dead in my eyes and said, I'm running lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> and I walked away and I said, he got it from here. I mean, if that is not the most Dave Simmons out there, no, that, is like, that is in the character, man. <laughs> Facts. Okay, uh, last question for you, Michael, sir. Lena Lacaro from the LA Weekly asks, this is a true LA story. What is the significance of Los Angeles as a backdrop for the film in terms of how growing up in the city has shaped Adonis and Dave as, as people, but also in terms of where they end up, where they live, where they train, and ultimately where they fight the fight of their lives? Okay, <clears throat> there's a lot in there. I, th I think, um, first and foremost, from a, a franchise perspective, uh, you know, you've seen that, you know, Adonis start in LA and then end up in Philly, you know, in search of this, you know, of, of this of this of this teacher, of this mentor, you know, that's gonna help him achieve the things that he needs to achieve in, in Iraq and in Philadelphia. And um, you know, having the second film be mostly in Philly, you know, and then, you know, a little bit in, in Los Angeles and then we end up in, in, in Russia. 
Um, we never really had a chance to really establish Adonis' home. You know, what's his home base? What really shaped him? And since we were kind of treating this like an origin story, you know, and a sequel and a trilogy all kind of in one, we we uh, we thought it was like important to make L.A. a a character, you know, um, a homecoming of sorts. And then you break it down further. It's like, okay, cool. You know, what childhood trauma did they share? You know, who was his first protector? You know, who was his first? You know, you know, product. We're products of our environments. So we we so we we leaned into the reality of those environments. You know, um, be from Crenshaw. You know, Donis. You know, kind of. Baldwin Hills ish, you know, Beverly Bel Air ish, you know, and then that that type of area that, that you know, that where black families lived and thrived, you know, that had money. Where would Apollo Creed be at, you know? Um we talked to those things. Um and then we started thinking about, you know, just you know what iconic um environments do we want to put these two guys in when in the form of montages or, you know, driving down the street, what familiar places that aren't oversaturated when you think of LA and Hollywood. Sometimes those can be a little bit cheesy when it comes to films, you know what I mean? Like we're not going down the Hollywood Walk of Fame and this and that and, and you know, and certain areas that are very familiar to LA, but what hasn't been photographed before? What hasn't what what, what parts of LA that you don't really see um, on film and television. So that was a challenge to kind of find those places. Um, and ultimately, we ended up at one of the more iconic places, the Hollywood sign. So, 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 there's certain things you can't get away from, you know. Um, and I think it served it, 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 it served as a you know as a as a final kind of nail, you know what I'm saying? That I felt that Adonis needed, that I think the audience needed to see and feel like this is you know Hollywood was his first like nickname that they yeah. gave him when he went to Philly was Hollywood, you know. So it felt very poetic to kind of come back around in that, in that type of way. So. Um, and then, you know, new developments that came up in Los Angeles, Sixth Street Bridge, you know, it was a new, new, new place that we wanted to, you know, that was starting to become very, very popular. And, you know, um, you know, with, you know, with, you know, people running their car, right, drag racing down there, you know, and, you know, walking the bridge, and it's very visual, and we want to kind of just take new places. So that's just, you know, visually we want to just take them to different, different spots. I will say the film, even though it went to familiar places, it still did even the Hollywood sign differently, like showing it from the back, just like the film, even though it's a Rocky movie, there's familiar beats, there's something new in every installment. So I want to thank you all for being um, the parts that made this installment so incredible. I want to thank you all for watching and remind everyone that Creed 3 is in theaters. 3, 2, 2, 3. Like y'all already <laughs> like, programmed on that. Thank y'all very much. <laughs> Two, three, two, three, right? Did I say right? Three, 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 oh my God, I'm doing it wrong. Three, three, two, three. Sorry. Three, three, two, three. Sorry. Thank you.